Welcome back to the review of A Conscious Universe by Armando Calvo. There's not so much left. Today we're on Chapter 4, Live, Love, and Laugh. Commas can be a problem in this book. This chapter's about, uh, something dumb, probably. I don't know. We have all heard this beautiful saying, live, love, and laugh. You mean that banal phrase they used, like, ten plus years ago to sell millions of the same cheap wall decals from China to bland middle-aged American women as a substitute for a personality? Yeah, I've heard of it. Amando says enjoying life and loving and laughing are nice and stuff. And then says, But here is the question that kicks off this section. Inappropriate semicolon. Should have been a colon. Why are these things good? You can pretty much see where this is going. What I'm asking for is an explanation of these things and why these things occur. Are you though? Because that's not what you just asked. You asked why they're good, which is a question about what people value. Now you say you want an explanation for why people experience them at all, which is more a question about psychology or neuroscience, stuff like that. Why is it good and why does it happen are not similar questions, but you're acting like they're the same question. You know, it'd be nice to see the tiniest amount of consistency at some point in this book, but as usual, I'm asking too much. But if you wanted an explanation of the neuroscience and psychology of, um, positive emotions, you would have gone and got one. Like, by interviewing a psychologist, maybe, or for the lazy budget option, by reading some relevant book. And then, instead of asking people to reply to your book with an explanation, you could have included at least someone's explanation in the book, which might have given you some actually interesting material to work with, as opposed to the nothing that you have right now. What exactly do we mean by life? What is love? And why is laughter important? To an atheist who rejects intelligent design, order, and purpose, what do they suppose these qualities of life signify? If we are nothing more than a byproduct of a random effect due to an unintelligent, impersonal, unguided, and unintended cause, then what is the purpose of life? What is love? And where does it come from? Why is laughter a positive thing? And what amount of consciousness is needed to recognize something as funny or simply laughable? How many more distinct questions was that? Eight, by my count, if I don't count what is love twice, even though he wrote it twice. I especially like the one about what these qualities of life signify, as if the point of positive emotions is to be signs pointing to other stuff. Which he probably does think, he probably thinks they're signs pointing to God, like every other thing he's ever heard of. But why does he think that would apply to an atheist? So he's asked all these questions in his book, and put no effort into getting an answer from anyone. In a real book, when a question is asked, to which the answer may not be immediately obvious, the next thing might be, I went and asked so-and-so, and here's the answer that so-and-so gave. Or, according to such-and-such -such source, it's this or that. And then if the author's feeling argumentative, maybe he or she'll spend some time critiquing the answer. But not our Almondo. He doesn't bother looking for answers in the first place. Oh, he'll make up answers to a couple of these questions in the coming sections, because he can't feel like he's winning the fight if there are no straw men to knock down. But as usual, he's very careful to avoid asking these questions to a real person who might actually answer him. Armando has no curiosity and no interest in truth, and so to him, questions aren't asked expecting an answer. They're not really even questions at all. They're just a way to rhetorically create a ridiculous, irrational, utterly fictional enemy, so he can proclaim his glorious intellectual victory over the demonic atheist hordes. The first half or so of this chapter is divided into three main sections, live, love, and laugh. Actually, no, sorry. It's life, love, and laugh, because he forgot his own format. In the life section, he says life is beautiful and wombs are beautiful. I don't know if he's ever seen one. And abortion is wrong and we all want to be happy and well-treated. These patterns of repetitive significance demonstrate a purpose of some sort. A purpose to live, be happy, and be successful. Now, why would these things matter in a world that was not set up to have specific goals and directions? As usual, he's asking this not actually wanting an answer, but I'll answer this time. He's basically answered it himself. The world doesn't need a goal for a person to have a goal. Let's take an organism with much simpler drives and needs than a human, just for example's sake. This is like Almando looking at a barnacle on a rock, striving for food, and saying, Why would food matter to the barnacle if it doesn't matter to the rock? Because the rock's not a barnacle. The world isn't a human. Yeah, humans see purpose in living and being happy and being successful. But the world doesn't have to. 
My interest in where I walk and why is not dependent on the ground I'm walking on also being interested. So yeah, that's the answer, but here's Almondo's answer. Is it because we know that whatever makes a person happy means that it's lawful? What if rape or murder makes someone happy? Is that lawful? You might notice that despite being presented as a possible answer to the question of why happiness and success matter, this in no way addresses the question. At all, or anything even close to it. It addresses a totally unrelated question about whether atheists define lawful as just literally anything that makes anyone happy, which is so stupid it's not even worth answering. So he completely forgot the topic within one sentence. Now, unsurprisingly, he starts talking about the Holocaust and how unrepentant Hilter was. Yes, Hilter. Danny little excursion, are we, Mr. Hilter? Uh, yeah, yeah. After which he starts talking about objective morality, which I'm pretty sure has shown up in at least two of the chapters we've already covered. Why structure your book when you can just flap your hands and feet around on the keyboard for three hours instead? He spends most of page 56 rambling about how 99.9% .9 of people think what Hitler did, yeah, it's Hitler now, but with a lowercase h, uh, that they think what he did was evil, which apparently is supposed to show that there's an objective moral standard rather than just a very common human standard. And then because there's an objective standard, that's God! And so life is important because we're made in the image of God, but if we're not, then we have no reason to believe human lives are more important than beetle lives. <laughs> Yeah, we've heard all this before from Almando himself, no need to waste time on it. Let's get on to the next section, love. He starts by saying that he thinks love is nice and other people also think so too. How insightful. Then he tells us what love is by copying the first definition of love he found on Google and then tacking tenderness on the end. I don't know why he thought his audience would be unfamiliar with this term and need it defined for them, or that we couldn't Google it ourselves if we wanted to, but okay. He asks, why do we love? What's the sole purpose? Uh, your guess is as good as mine. Then he says that atheists think it's a chemical balance within a person. If that is true, then love is nothing more than a chemical. Which contradicts the claim he just made about it being a chemical balance. A balance of chemicals is not a chemical, it's a balance. Then he confirms that he's completely tossed his balance idea in the trash. Love is not a true, willful, and conscious decision. Love is a measurement of pixie dust within the jar of the human brain. This is absurd! Now, I'll agree that just saying it's a chemical is an extremely inadequate explanation for love. Intentionally so, on Almondo's part, because he needs his straw man to be as weak and unstable as possible if he's gonna try to knock them down just by calling them names. And I don't know where he's got this idea that love is a measurement of any kind, but this doesn't just read like Almondo rejection of this specific straw man. This reads like a rejection of the possibility of chemical influence over human mental states entirely. The idea that the chemical environment within your brain can produce or influence an emotion is absurd to him. That's quite a position, which he does, in fact, for once, attempt to justify. His justification is that if love is chemically influenced, then it's not truly a free choice and you are basically forced against your own will to love that person. Apparently missing the point that you do, in fact, very often feel emotions against your own will, and almost never just because of your will. Love, hate, anger, sadness, it happens a lot that people feel these kind of emotions and wish they didn't. And on the other hand, people often wish they felt things like happiness, or satisfaction, or peace, but they can't just will that feeling into being. So he's saying this as though it's unrealistic, despite the fact that it's perfectly in line with everyday human experience. Also, it sounds like he's saying that love is only real and legitimate if having the feeling is something you consciously decided to do. If the feeling just comes over you, with you having no say in it, which as far as I'm aware is how love is supposed to work, then that's fake love. That's love against your will, you're some kind of a brain slave. No, real love is you sit down, coldly, emotionlessly, and engage in decision making. Maybe you draw some flowcharts to decide if you really wish to experience this feeling. And if the feeling meets your criteria, then you, by your own will, switch it on. I'm sure his wife finds that real romantic. Good evening, female partner. I wish to inform you that initially I felt nothing for you, but I calculated that it was in accordance with my will and in my best interests to engage in the sensation of love, and so I began to do so. Occasionally I turn off the love switch to reevaluate and ensure that my actions remain aligned to my true will. Thank you for your attention. I will repeat this romantic gesture tomorrow. 
So how could we truly know if we love that person totally? So love isn't a feeling that you just feel. If you just feel it, you can't know if you feel it. Apparently the only way you can know you have a feeling is if your will takes precedence over the feeling. And you can just turn it on and off at will. Man, Christianity's weird. I see where the confusion is here, though. Amando operates on the assumption that the will is something separate from the brain. Mind-body dualism. He thinks there must be a clear distinction between your body and your mind. And so any idea that suggests that the mind is of the body is simply unacceptable, and somehow makes the mind less real, because it's less like what he thinks it should be. And that, I guess, is why he says that love being a product of a material brain is absurd, because he finds its consequences unacceptable. Nothing on this page is an argument, it's just Almando being a big baby. How could you be certain that what you believe is absolutely true if what you believe is only the result of an unintelligible evolution of cells? As I've said to you many times, I can't be certain if what I believe is absolutely true, but not for the reason you give. The reason you give is meaningless junk. The limits of human cognition and perception exist and are the same regardless of whether they're based in biology or spiritual woo. Absolute certainty is equally nonsensical whether it's asserted by a Christian or an atheist. And the acknowledgement of that lack of absolute certainty is what encourages intellectual humility, which partially explains why you appear to have none. Enough said on that, don't have to get into it again, on we go. He insincerely asks several times why evolution would make people believe in God, and then answers his own question by saying God must have done it, and that there are many questions that cannot be answered thoroughly by the atheistic position. Which is true. Amando's questions can't be answered by anyone, at least not to him, because he's barricaded himself away where nobody can talk to him. He keeps on asking questions rhetorically through this book, which have real detailed answers that he will never hear because he's a scared little chicken shit bitch. I simply disagree with their position in totality. Which is an outright totality lie. Because he doesn't even know or care what their position is. If you're going to claim that you totally disagree with something, you should probably know what that something is first. And this book demonstrates with perfect clarity that Almando has no clue. At the end of this section, he takes a random swipe at the gaze for some reason. No, love is not love. That does not make any sense, and it is inconsistent. What is it then, chopped liver? On to the laugh section. He tells that old joke about two guys seeing a bear and the one guy says he just has to outrun the other guy. It was lame the first time and it's lame now. It's for sure copied verbatim from somewhere without credit, but it's basically a meme at this point. It's been copied everywhere with no clear original author. It's one of those jokes that's been told for years. This kind of a joke was basically the old guy's version of a meme. I remember my grandpa telling jokes like this all the time that everybody knew came through like 50 other guys before him. So, eh. He explains that sometimes we find things funny. Did you know that? That there's this thing called funny. I sure didn't. I'm learning a lot here. These moments can come from a joke. A surprise accident. Like someone slipping on a banana. A sound. Farting. The way something or someone looks. A memory of a good time or funny event. Or even tickles. A physical activity. I see. This the funny that you speak of sounds fascinating. I am currently choosing to engage in a strong emotional response to this new information. I wish to inform you that I have willingly chosen to partake in this feeling after rational consideration of the effects. Thus, I am fully aware that I am, in fact, feeling the feeling. I have elected to love having this feeling. For the moment. But how does this prove good? God! Oh, oh, I know, I know, me, me, I know! Is it, uh, uh, therefore God? Yeah, I knew it! Laughter is a part of the human ability to express joy and happiness, a value that all of mankind loves to experience. This joy and happiness comes from good moments and times where you feel the most jubilation. It's a value that consists of reason, purpose, consciousness, free will, and rationality. And then he has a bullet point for each of these, explaining why each one is necessary for, um, for the, the joy and happiness, or the laughter. It's not really clear. 
But yeah, he explains why they're each needed for something. Personally, I'm most curious about free will, because in my opinion, genuine laughter, like genuine love, is involuntary. It's not something you willingly decide to do, and if you do, it's not really real. It's an act. But Almando seems to think it's the opposite, so I'm real curious what he has to say about joy and happiness and laughter being dependent on free will. To explain why reason is necessary, he says, and I'm gonna read the whole thing because it's just bizarre, and I'd hate to miss any of it. If reason didn't have a logical foundation and wasn't designed for the purpose of rational thinking and putting things together, then how could something as funny as a joke be comprehensible in a mind wired to control all aspects of human functionality? What's he trying to say with that? I think it's something like you need to actually understand the joke to laugh at it, and also that if the human brain performs multiple functions, then it doesn't make sense that it could uh, perform one function. Maybe. But then I think he's also questioning the foundation of human reason at the same time, which doesn't seem relevant to the application of reason to a joke or the multiple functions of the brain. Yeah, overall it's basically incomprehensible because of how it's written. He goes on. In other words, how could something be considered funny? If all reactions are only a byproduct of chemical reactions, your body is randomly reacting to a particular motion in the process of sound waves and patterns coming from an audible, worded sound and or visual event, making whatever caused you to react not necessarily funny per se, but the vibrations of chemical activity and motion within the human brain. Which reads like a demand that if an event is interpreted as funny, it must be objectively funny. Or funny per se. It's very similar, nearly identical, to the demand for objective morality, and I'm surprised that you don't hear it more often. I guess it just doesn't have as much emotional impact. So it's not enough that what your senses perceive and your brain interprets cause a subjective experience of funny. The event in and of itself must be funny, objectively, and then pure funniness has to be transmitted to your mind as something separate and distinct from your brain. So again, we have more of this dualistic thinking applied to the very much non-dualistic physicalism. If a mind happens to be the product of physical processes, that's not really a mind, even if by all appearances and by your own subjective experience it works exactly the same way as the soul woo-woo mind, because to Almando, a mind can only be legitimate if it conforms with his religious ideas, if it's some kind of a ghost that's not linked to the body in any important way. Why? Because he likes his religion. That's why. If the mind works the same way either way, I don't see any meaningful difference. A mind is a mind regardless of what platform it's running on. But apparently he thinks this distinction really matters. What's even weirder is it's not just a physical mind that he's objecting to here. It's physical sound or physical light transmitting something funny to your senses. So does his denial of the physical go all the way to denying the physical basis of sight and hearing? Well, according to his brain section, where he kept telling us things like how the eye works and how the ear works instead of how the brain works, you might think no, but I don't think he read that section. He just copied stuff so that he had a definition there. So yeah, based on this here, I think he does reject it. In which case, how does he think they work then, assuming he's thought about this at all. Big assumption, I know. His explanation for why purpose is needed to laugh is basically that humor's based in the unexpected, and so by his example, a person at a graduation ceremony who unexpectedly trips over a wire and falls on their face is funny, but a clown doing rehearsed falls isn't. I disagree that the former is funny, I think it's uncomfortable and unpleasant and embarrassing by proxy. Grow up and have some empathy, you dick. But all this is a weird position to take after the first sentence here, which is, If a particular joke or event did not have a specific and direct purpose, then how could we judge something as funny or laughable if that particular event isn't based on some type of foundational basis? Which would imply that the clown, whose whole specific and direct purpose is to joke around and make you laugh, should be funnier than the graduate, whose fall had no purpose at all. In fact, only the clown should be able to be funny, if this is true. 
Again, some consistency would really be appreciated, Almondo. The third need, consciousness, must be necessary because, you know, what are you gonna do, laugh in your sleep? That's about all that needs to be said, if we have any sense at all, but for some reason he spends more time on this one than any of the other ones. He takes over half a page to basically just say that you have to be conscious to understand what's funny. Oh, and he defines consciousness by plagiarizing the first Google definition. Towards the end, he says consciousness is required for free will and rationality, and that reference to free will gets me all tingly, so let's get on to the next bullet point, where finally Finally, we get to the thing I was really curious about, why free will is needed to laugh at a joke. His answer is, actually never mind, he just stops after consciousness and moves on without addressing free will or rationality at all. Oh, well that's disappointing. Anyway, to close out the laugh section, he goes on a nonsensical ramble about evolution, which I also think is worth reading fully. Evolution does not possess any of the following. After which he does not list things that evolution does not possess. He just says the following, and then it's followed by nothing. And to say it does, or to say it had evolved that way, is to say that the process had a purpose-driven goal. As he's done multiple times before in this book, he describes evolution as creationism. If not, then why would you believe the contrary if you yourself have no ultimate purpose to believe against these facts? So, I know this is supposed to be something about how you can't rationally believe stuff unless God made it your purpose to do that, or some similar nonsense, but really it reads like just a scrap heap of words. The writing in this book just sucks horribly. Hey Almondo, you know how they say a good writer should read more than he writes? Try that. It's okay, you can start with picture books. It's self-defeating to say that there is no ultimate goal or purpose, and then to argue that point as factual as if that in itself is the sole purpose of the understanding of life. As if what's the sole purpose of the understanding of life? The lack of an ultimate purpose? The lack of that purpose is the purpose. What are you even trying to say? If you read this back, would you even know what you meant? You are making an objective claim by those same arguments. By what arguments? You haven't even mentioned an argument here, straw man or otherwise. You've mentioned a couple of claims. Do you mean claims, not arguments? Claims like, there is no ultimate goal or purpose, or, uh, the contrary to whatever it was. Well, yeah, if I make claims, I'm making claims. Yes. Mind-blowing information, I know. It's like you know the precise intent of the evolutionary process. Interesting, I shall say. It's truly inconsistent. Like I know the precise intent. Okay, let me try to steel man this a bit. I think, maybe, that Almondo's word diarrhea here might be supposed to mean something along these lines. If you say evolution did not have a purpose-driven goal, then that means that you're claiming or arguing to know that evolution is not a purposeful process, but Almondo thinks that's irrational because you can't actually know whether it is or not by observing it. Maybe. Okay, but that doesn't explain what he meant with the ultimate purpose to believe stuff, or the sole purpose of the understanding of life stuff, or what that gotcha was supposed to be in saying that it's an objective claim, so it's not the best steel man, I admit. I'm not a miracle worker, alright? There are limits. To add to that, if you are going to assume that evolution or the process of chemical mutation has intent, you are presupposing that evolution had a purpose or goal. That completely destroys your own position. You might as well become a theist, haha. -ha. He wrote haha -ha in a book like it's a text message. Okay, never mind, I'm pretty sure my attempt at a steel man there was nothing close to whatever the hell he meant. He seems to just seriously think that the idea of evolution is that it's intentional and purposeful. Well, he's right, if I assumed that, it would completely destroy evolution. And yeah, I might as well become a theist, because that's pretty close to creationism. But of course, that's not what evolution is, and mutation doesn't have intent. I've had to keep pointing out through this book that these things that he assigns intent to don't have intent behind them. That's the whole point. So whatever point he thinks he's making just isn't a point. All of this is completely pointless. Well, on to the next section, emotions and desires. What do you think this'll be about? I bet it'll be people have emotions, therefore God. So the exact same thing we've already heard a bunch of times, but gotta pat out that book. He switches to a quirky hand-printing looking font to tell us a first-person story about a time that he, or more likely just the fictional protagonist of the story, managed to score a date with a barista at a coffee shop. I can't really decide if I think this story's original or not. It's not good, and I can't find any source for it, and there's some pretty bad tense switching and grammar at the end. 
She placed the coffees down, pulled out a seat, and sat down across from me and smiled. I was at a silent shock. She notices and replies with, Would you like to have a coffee date? And this is the day I personally met your mother. The last sentence also seems to be imitating that awful sitcom everyone used to pretend was good. And he seems to have totally forgotten what the story was about, which is a barista he'd met every morning for some time, not someone he just met for the first time that day. All of which points to it being an Almondo original. But on the other hand, he says that he was wearing barley corn colored loafers, and I just can't see him coming up with something so pretentious. So I put it at about 50-50. Such a wonderful story about a couple who met in a coffee shop, right? No. Except it was made up. You don't say. But let's look at this scenario for a moment. Notice all of the highlighted wording. And at this point, I had to look very carefully at the story to try to see the highlighted wording. Turns out he actually means bold, not highlighted. It was hard to see. I didn't even notice it the first time. For some reason, despite him explicitly mentioning the bold text and this being important to his point, he decided to use a font with hardly any difference between regular and bold. You'd think at some point he'd do something right just by accident, but nope. They all have something in common, and that's emotions, feelings, and desires. And then for some reason he explains to us which emotions the characters were feeling at each point where the text is bolded. In other words, the places where, as he's just said, the story already tells us what they were feeling. Thanks, Almondo. I really needed help figuring out that the story says what the story says. More interesting, though, is what the story doesn't say. It doesn't say that the characters felt nothing, and then made a conscious, willful decision to begin to feel something, and then only after making this free, willful choice, made themselves begin to feel. One might almost think that feelings aren't driven by the will. And so Almondo's rejection of a biological brain on the grounds that you don't control your biologically driven feelings through your will applies equally to his beliefs as well. But see, this is Almondo, and so it's only a problem for ideas he doesn't like. A man or woman of pure desire and emotion demonstrates the quality and behavior of what true consciousness and will looks like. The conscious decisions of their actions and the will to fulfill their desires. Okay, the desires that come from where? You basically said love's not real if you didn't will it into being. If it came from something within you that you don't control. And now it sounds like emotions and desires are the same way. These values don't just evolve in a person, it is a part of their core nature. Evolved in a person, an individual, and somehow evolved is posed as opposite to part of their core nature. Well, in case we needed any more evidence that Almondo has no idea what evolution is, there it is. But you know, in the colloquial meaning of just change over time, emotions and desires most definitely do evolve in a person. The emotions Almondo highlighted in the story were thinking a woman is wonderful, her enjoying taking his order, him having a crush on her and finding her beautiful, him feeling a little bit sad because she wasn't working that day, him feeling disappointed pointed when he thinks she had another date, and him being shocked when she sits down with him. Now, I don't know if you noticed, Almondo, but you're not born wanting to bang the barista at a coffee shop, or take customer orders. It doesn't matter how much free will you assign to a two-year-old, these ideas simply are not going to occur to a child that age. To have any of these feelings requires a great deal of biological change and experiential change, I guess you would say. And you're not going to be choosing which desires you have as a result of those changes. They're just gonna happen. You might say you act willfully on your desires, but those desires are not in you because you willed them to be. Your desires when you reach maturity are very different from those you have when you're a kid, whether you like it or not. This is not in your control. Your objections to the biological brain aren't actually objections to biology or the brain. They're objections to the basic reality of all human experience, regardless of whether that comes from a brain or a soul. It makes no difference. There was never a time we were numb or had no capabilities to these areas of emotions and desires for the lack of evolutionary progress. We had always possessed them. Evolution didn't one day decide that it wanted to develop a chemical or cell of love. It didn't practice repetitive recognition of certain abilities and then apply them to our human character. Okay, you can stop now. We understand that you don't have the first clue what evolution is, okay? That was clear after the first few demonstrations. You don't have to keep demonstrating it, okay? I mean, it's goddamn hilarious, but the secondhand embarrassment is getting painful. We know losing a loved one is sad. We don't evolve that feeling. We know pain hurts. We don't evolve to feel suffering or discomfort. Or keep doing it. That's fine too. No problem. 
We may lose love for a person, but that doesn't change the definition of love. Yeah, I'm aware that the definitions of words don't change when one random person's feelings change. Who is this even directed at? Perversions are the molded acts of what is proper and definite, and objective definitions are absolute and unchanging. Now, I'm pretty sure that's meant as another swipe at gay people, but what it really gets me thinking about is this. Is this why he's so willing to snatch definitions off Google and pretend like he wrote them? Because definitions are absolute and unchanging and so can't have been written by a human but just exist as some eternal fundamental feature of reality? Google's just accessing definitions that were hammered into stone at the beginning of the universe itself? I don't know, maybe. This is why the definition of love is not love. What is it then? Chopped liver? Oh, sorry, I already used that one. Let's get a little scientific, he says, and everybody groans. We know that scientific study for human emotion and feelings says this. I don't know why he would even start a sentence with that, because clearly he doesn't give a single shit about scientific study about human emotions and feelings. I don't know how he could make that more clear. But so this is more plagiarism, in this case from Very Well Mind. At least this time it's in italics to imply that he didn't write it himself, but it's not stated that it's from someone else and it's not credited. And then he starts trying to square this chapter with the last one, because in the last chapter he spent lots of time explaining all the different functions of the brain, but in this one he essentially denies that any aspect of human experience is a function of the brain. And he's only just now noticed the contradiction there. Well, at least he noticed in time for some damage control. Each focus point in the brain demonstrates the ability of emotional capabilities. It doesn't explain or define them. Which sounds an awful lot like, I don't care if you figure out how the brain works, you still need God to explain it. If you think he means something else, I guess put it in the comments, but I don't know what it would be. Every stem or wire in the brain doesn't come with an instruction manual or a descriptive explanation of each functionality. What we know comes from what is written in our consciousness. A brain doesn't have authority, nor does a brain tell us which emotion is what and how each emotion works. We just know, intuitively. Oh, I see. You don't need no brain telling you what to do. Might as well rip that thing right out of your head. You'll still work just fine. Because you're not your brain. The real reason you have emotions, according to the science of emotions, is you just do. Yeah, Professor Calvo's got a thorough, complete explanation. Not like those stupid fucking scientists with their lobes and their chemicals. It doesn't take a master scholar to know this self-evident truth. A child knows when they are sad or mad, and they know why they feel that way most of the time. Oh, classic. Going Kent Hovind style here, the argument from child. So when little Billy's mad that Todney called him a wiener, and I ask him why he's mad, he's going to be able to explain it as deeply as a psychologist or a neuroscientist? Or is he just going to say he's mad because Todney's a jerk and said a mean word? Well, apparently little Billy's the authority here, and the neuroscientists and psychologists are just dumb assholes, despite Elmondo relying on them for the previous chapter. So, uh, yeah, that's how anger works. You just are that. Well, it's literally as good as any other explanation Elmondo has for anything. It's completely not special. If the brain was the ultimate source that had full authority and control, and every emotional peace factor determined the arrangements of what causes what for each emotional effect, then every individual would react in the same consistent way, regardless of the situation. We would all be molecular robots. He keeps displaying such creative new levels of ignorance that it's hard for me to even put into words what's wrong with it. Like, why is he so stuck on this idea that if minds emerge from physical brains that implies that all brains must behave identically? Where is that even coming from? Nowhere, I'm pretty sure is where. He just thinks it must be the case. Because. Or, well, I guess because we would be molecular robots. Which I have to say, in the age of ChatGPT, is a pretty bad analogy. Hell, forget ChatGPT, take the Boston Dynamics dog robot. Take really any somewhat advanced robot or artificial intelligence. Even literal robots don't react in the same consistent way regardless of the situation. They're adaptive, variable individual. So granting his premise about molecular robots, why does he think being molecular robots would preclude us from being the same way? Adaptive, variable, individual. Well, because. That's why. Just cuz. Anyway, then he says that we feel things because God made minds and brains. Why? Just cuz. 
He never really bothers to justify that sort of claim really anywhere in this book. He just says he disagrees with his dumbass interpretation of some non-god explanation for stuff, and then says, well, it's gotta be god then, just cuz. The next section is relationships, and it's more of the same. Love and relationships and families and morality and taboos and crime are all worthless and meaningless concepts without God, and atheists should not acknowledge them or care about them because they only make sense if God did it, supposedly. Stuff like this. If there are no objective wrongs, conviction should not have a place in the hearts of any man that commits any opposing actions according to their desire or will, whether of good or evil. So he's straight up encouraging atheists into nihilism and antisocial behavior behavior because he'd find it rhetorically convenient if we started thinking that way. This type of argument turns really gross when it turns into insisting people think and act in negative and harmful ways in hopes that there will be some tragic result that winds up netting a convert or two. Good thing nobody listens to these despicable freaks. I hope that's a true statement. I'm probably being very optimistic with that. Enough said. Next section. Which is good and evil. And of course it's just more of the same. For example, he talks about some crimes of Christopher Columbus, abuse, slavery, murder, and then says, Although I agree that Christopher was wrong in this case, what objective standard do I have to judge him by that can count as worthy? Or what can we say against it? Well, according to evolution, if we find things beneficial and prosperous, then we must deem it worthy to carry out. Well, that's exactly what Hitler and Stalin did. I have no idea who this Stalin with two L's is. Sounds like a nickname for a BMX guy. What's going on with the names in this book? Most of these people don't even seem to have first names at all. Kelper, Hilter, Stalin, but Columbus. Almando's on a first name basis with old Christopher. But yeah, again, he's insisting that anyone who accepts evolution must engage in hideous behavior, or well, at the very least be permissive of it. This is telling us that we must follow the direction of evolutionary progression in all areas in order to prosper and achieve greater things. He's talking about evolution as if it's a god handing down commandments. He just can't seem to stop thinking about evolution as something very like his god. This is a very narrow mind we're dealing with. So, those who commit crimes, such as rape and murder, should not only be left alone, but understood that what they do is a result of their instinctive reaction and progress within their brain's development. This leads to great calamity. Yeah, we know. So there's an obvious pragmatic reason to avoid and punish that kind of behavior. And to not encourage it, like you're doing right now. Why is it that the only people I ever see encouraging vile behavior using evolution as the excuse are creationists? Well, it seems like it's because they think it's useful to their moronic cause to do so. But we don't just freely run around doing things like this with no sort of conviction. Of course we have evil people in the world, but we all recognize the moral account of what is right and what is wrong. Uh, there's some stuff that's very broadly agreed upon, not universally though, but there's a lot of petty religious morality that a lot of us in no way recognize. But the real extreme stuff, the stuff that, as you say, leads to great calamity if it becomes common, yeah, most of us are on board with that because we don't like calamity. Who wants to live through anything that could be called a calamity? Which is why even a criminal runs from the police and hides away from the light, because they know that their deeds are evil. What? No, you might have misheard something. Uh, that's because they know their deeds are illegal, and they're being chased by cops, and criminals tend not to want to go to jail. But please, tell me more about your great insights into the human mind. Same way a liar tries to cover their lies, because they know what they're doing is wrong. Or because they don't want to get caught in the lie, for various reasons. Same way a thief hides what they take and avoid getting caught, because they know what they are doing is evil. That's the second time you've misheard illegal as evil. Seriously, you think the reason people want to avoid going to jail is because of objective morality? Not because it's jail? But why would they think jail's a bad place to be if there's no objective standard that says jail is bad? Yeah, shut up. Our shame, guilt, and regret reveal to us an objective standard. No, they reveal a standard, probably even many standards, that says nothing about whether these standards are objective or not. How people feel really doesn't say anything about how well their feelings accord with actual reality. 
And if there is an objective standard beyond humanity, there must be a personal mind who has established these intelligent, ordered, and direct laws. That being is not the conscious universe. That being is God. That is because God is. Elmondo forgot which book he's writing and snapped back into God is mode there for a second. But wait, he doesn't believe in a conscious universe? Well then, why is the book called A Conscious Universe, The Incredible Cause That Had an Amazing Plan? Doesn't that subtitle imply that the conscious universe is God? But no, apparently the conscious universe is an atheistic universe, somehow. What? I don't know what the hell the title of this book is even supposed to imply anymore. But anyway, we're at the end of this chapter, and I'm glad, because my voice is tired. So thanks for watching. Next time we'll move on to chapter 5. Just three left. If you would, before you go, please do give the video a like and click subscribe if you haven't. And if you like the channel, also please consider supporting. Just a couple bucks a month, or per video if you like, helps a huge amount. And enormous thanks to all of my supporters who've already made that choice. For early access, email list, list.logic.com, and I'll see you next time.